Uh, let's give a big hand to the worship team. Thank you. Thank you for serving us so well. Well done. If you've got your Bibles there, I'd love for you to get them out. Uh, we're going to get into the Word together. We're going to go deep today. Are you ready for a deep dive? Yeah, good. That's good. And let me pray. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to actually come, worship, be together, fellowship together, be central around uh, who you are uh, uh, in our lives. Lord, I pray that today that you will help me to speak your word into, um, into our church. Lord, I pray that you'll give me the right words to say. Lord, I pray that the people have the right hearts to hear. In your name, amen. 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 Well, my subject today is called R&R, &R, R and r Anyone know what R&R &R means? Anyone? Yeah, versions of that, yes. Um, I've renamed R&R, &R, I've called it Redemption and Restoration. Redemption and Restoration, R&R. &R. You know, you don't have to go too many weeks um, where you don't read the newspaper and hear about some faults or failures in someone's life often splashed across the front page of the paper. That's a bit uh, unfortunate. And fundamentally, it can be frustrating because you go, why did they make that mistake? Why did they do that? They should have just, just walked away from that particular scenario. And then we hear sometime later about, about all the failures that they made. And it, it can be very frustrating. And then if you take the time, if you can move on from that moment, then we start to analyse our own lives and you realise, well, I'm happy to accept some faults in myself. But usually we're far less forgiving of other people in our world, especially leaders. I mean, we expect, for example, our sports people to be outstanding role models. And we now know that that's not always the case. We expect our political leaders to be perfect in integrity. No comment or no noise? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, we expect our Christian leaders to be better than everybody else, uh, morally, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, all of these different areas. And of course, um, different ones let people down. And yet then for some bizarre reason, think about this. We let celebrities who are typically good at acting, um, for example, preach their worldview about a whole range of topics and we treat that as gospel. Um, can I just be a little bit cheeky here for a second and remind you they're good at acting. That, sound, that was sort of a bit tongue-in-cheek, but everyone took that very seriously. Mm. Um, being good at one thing, Austin, as a soccer player or what, as a youth pastor, does not qualify you to be expert in everything. Um, just by the way, uh, that's a little thought. But today we better get into some biblical uh, meat. And I want to talk about this thought and continue this line around leadership and how the Bible unpacks it. Um, and the Bible actually gives you many different narratives around different leadership journeys. I mean, really, on all of the different characters we hear about, apart from Jesus, we hear about all the um, faults and failings of different leaders. The Bible doesn't try to dress that up. It actually tells you the whole story. Um, uh, in some cases, it can be actually quite uncomfortably authentic when you're reading these stories and I'll give you some names and you'll have your own uh, thoughts about their leadership journeys. Adam and Eve for example, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Samson, Saul, David himself. I mean all of these people loved God and were seeking to do his will and yet they still made faults, they still had failings in their leadership journey. I mean, we can just put a big underline under all of that and just say, thank God for God's grace. Amen? 
Thank God for God's grace. So I just want to take a little diversion off my main topic. And I want to take and remind you in this moment that one of our core attributes as Hope You See, I suppose in some ways it's an unspoken value. Um, hopefully it's an obvious value that does reflect the core of who we are and, of course, our leadership team. And that is, hope you see, is a grace church. That may be a revelation to you. Hopefully it's not. Um, if it's a, a revelation to you, we've done a poor job at being grace-filled. And so, therefore, then part of this message hopefully should encourage you. I mean, that means, for example, when we say we're a grace church, how does that work its way out? Well, I would give you just a couple examples today. There's many. Um, but this means that we have a welcome mat out for all people. We have a welcome mat out for all people, regardless of their life's journey to date. Um, you can even come and, and belong at Hope You See before you believe. That's another attribute of about what a grace church means, that you can belong before you believe. I mean, we also have a welcome back mat out um, for literally thousands of spiritual refugees who have walked away from other faith communities for a variety of reasons, but who are now wanting uh, to find a new spiritual home. If that's you, welcome home. I mean, hope you see, let me just remind you, like every other church is not perfect. But it's our dream of ours to be a place where you can be uh, welcomed, that you can find family, that you can have a place where you can be honest. If you've tried um, other churches and found them to be wanting for whatever reason, then I pray that your journey um, at this church um, becomes a place that you can learn to take a step of faith and put trust again in a local church. I mean, this is one of the beautiful aspects of what I would call a local church, where your brokenness, my brokenness, um, we can live together, we can be joined together, common in our uh, idea that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives and be a collective community that we would say to each other, um, I need you. To me, that is just another little bit of R&R, &R, redemption and restoration. So that's my little side, Eddie. Is that okay? Um, now let's get into the meat and get into the Bible this morning. Um, one of the most important, I believe, encounters um, with the resurrected Jesus was with the disciple Peter, um, who became... Um, or was a future church leader. But of course, Peter made a numerous poor decisions. And in one particular case that's well documented, he made a significant failing as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yet Jesus demonstrated grace and redemption to Peter, which then, I believe, models to us today how do we become grace people, how do we become a better grace church. But this series that we're in the middle of, middle of I should say, um, is really themed around an idea called what if. And so I want to apply the what if factor to Peter. And what if, you think about it, what if Peter had let his denial of Jesus, which we'll go into a little bit deeper shortly, define him instead of Peter being able to live in redemption and restoration. Imagine if Peter actually spent the rest of his life regretting those three denials of Jesus. Imagine if Peter actually wore a badge when he went to church that says three times denier. Imagine if everyone changed his name to say, oh, that's three times Pete. That he actually lived with this identity as the denier of Jesus Christ. But see, that's a what if. I want to talk about um, his encounter then with Jesus, where he was able to move on from that um, idea. 
we must ask ourselves when we start to dive deep here, what are we like with second chances for other people? Have you ever given someone a second chance, a third chance? We'll see, ask yourself this, put yourself in Jesus' shoes. If somebody publicly denied knowing you at all, absolutely said, I do not know you whatsoever, and did it three times in three different spots, publicly in a way, to three different groups of people, would you immediately think this person is exactly the person I need to lead the organisation that I want to be a part of or the movement that I want to be a part of? Of course, nobody would want to do that. We would typically shun them. They shun me, I'll shun them. I will now delete them on my Facebook page and I will not send them a Christmas card. That's what most of us would do. But Jesus, on the other hand, actually restored his relationship with Peter, brought Peter back into a place of emotional health and sent him on his way to be this future church leader that we know about. So Peter had three stages of his r and I want to take you back to that moment where the scriptures talk about Peter's denial and that's in Matthew's Gospel chapter 26. Matthew's Gospel chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 69. I think we've got this on the screen here as well. So this is the account. Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, you were one of those with Jesus the Galilean. Remember Jesus had been arrested. He'd actually been taken now into the, the courtyard with Pilate and he was now being harassed and questioned and all these things. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man, obviously pointing, was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with the oath. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. I can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore. A curse on me if I'm lying, I don't know that man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away and wept bitterly. In this courtyard setting, Peter is put to the test. The social pressure of this situation, you can feel the enormity in the energy and the language in Peter's response. It caused three denials to three different groups of people. I mean, if you and I were Peter's coach or mentor, we probably might have hustled up to him and say, hey, Peter, it's just better to say nothing. Because the more you say, you're just going deeper and deeper into problem. I mean, Peter made for sure poor decisions. I mean, you've got to give him some credit. The irony is the reason why he was at that location was he wanted to understand what was actually happening to Jesus. And yet he felt pressure to lie about his relationship Yet at the same time, the Gospels clearly show that Jesus is Peter's hero and mentor. I mean, what if? What if Peter had just admitted to his relationship with Jesus? It would have set him up to be free from the burden of the three denials. The Bible doesn't just say that he uh, regretted the Bible did, just doesn't say that he cried and, and was disappointed in himself. The Bible says that Peter 
wept bitterly. There I say, the Bible says the truth will set you free. The burden that Peter must have lived under after this encounter must have been huge. I mean, in John's Gospel, chapter 8, the Scriptures say you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Honestly, honesty is the best policy. I mean, that's just a cute little grandma saying, I know, but it's absolute truth. I mean, if you want to live emotionally rent-free, all you got to do is be honest in every situation. You've got to say the same thing here as what you say over there. You don't need to spin the story one way over here to make yourself look better and tell something else over here. Otherwise, you're continually thinking about and worried about who's going to find out what the truth is. Well, see, if you are just transparent and say the truth once, say the truth twice, say the truth three times, there is nothing to defend. You don't have to spin anything because it's just what it is. And again, then you are living rent-free in your head. Peter was burdened down and paying a huge rent to actually probably just live a normal life and not succumb to the pressure, the burden of denying Jesus three times. But God's grace is deep and wide. After Jesus Christ is resurrected, after three days, he appears. We know the tomb, the stone's been rolled away. And again, he starts to have different encounters with his disciples. And I want to pick up again the encounter between Jesus and Peter and see and hear the story about redemption and restoration, R and R. In John's Gospel, John chapter 21, let me read these first couple of verses for you. And it says, Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, the guy we're talking about. Uh, Thomas, nicknamed the twin. Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee. And two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. I wonder about that line. I apply my creative license and I think about the burden that Peter might have been under about the frustration. Oh, if only I, oh, if only I, oh, I should have just told the truth. I should have just said, yes, I'm a friend of his. Um, and, he, and he probably goes, I'm just going fishing. You know, I need some alone time. And then all of a sudden, all the other disciples said, yeah, well, we need alone time with you as well. I could imagine... Peter almost turning to the disciples, I'm applying my creative license here and saying, guys, really? I just, want, I just need to get this out of my head. I can't get it out of my head and we're coming too. So they went out in the boat. That was the end of my creative license. And they, they caught nothing at all, all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. I mean, this post-resurrection encounter with Peter is fascinating. I mean, remember, this encounter is very similar to the encounter that Jesus had with Peter when he first called him into the ministry. I mean, some scholars would say it's the same location. It's the same example of fishing. It's the same story about putting the net on the other side of the boat. And a similar miracle takes place. And you can read that in Luke chapter 5. Why did Jesus do this? Nothing about Jesus was just accidental or in a cute little story. There's a reason. And you could imagine now knowing and what we're focusing on, here is Jesus trying to bring Peter back into restoration, back with this sense of redemption and back on the thing that Jesus had called him to. So he reminds him, 
by this whole story, this miracle would not have gone unnoticed to the disciples, by the way. Three years earlier, the same thing happened. And, it, and it, Jesus takes Peter back to the starting place, back to where their relationship first started. So Peter could be brought back into the beauty of understanding Jesus and his first encounter, his first love, where Jesus reminds him that he was called to be fisher of men, not fishers of fish. What a beautiful thing that Jesus does. What a great grace act where Jesus mimics and mirrors the same story three years later. I mean, let's continue the conversation in that same chapter, John chapter 21. And it says there, this from verse 14, this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. I, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. The third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep. I mean, this is really like a threefold restoration for Peter. Again, another brilliant grace move by Jesus. No doubts for Peter going forward. I don't know about you, but I would have probably done the maths in my head. I denied Jesus three times. Um, but Jesus only uh, re released me from that, that burden once. D is there two more things I need release from? So again, Jesus goes the extra mile and goes, uh, uh, I'll, I'll ask him three times, does he love me? I'll ask him again the three times, does he, does he, what's his calling to be? And again, Jesus released him from that burden that he created by himself, by the way about the denial of Jesus, which was only a few days earlier. But not only does Jesus release him from that burden by engaging and having an encounter with him, but he also restores Peter's purpose as a leader, as a shepherd. And I think about this, about all the different systems that we create all in the workplace and in church life, and again, um, Jesus restores him back into the ministry. No probation, no jobs or works to complete. Just get back into it, Peter. I mean, God's grace is so powerful for redemption and restoration. I, I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I just sense that, that no matter what big thing that you carry... It's not too big for God's powerful grace that he can't overcome. It doesn't matter how deep, it doesn't matter how wide, that God's grace is big enough to cover you, to re redeem you, but not just redeem you, but actually restore you back on the path that God has a plan for you. And of course, what a beautiful narrative then about Peter. And we could argue that, go, oh yes, his life, he messed up, he made, he made some mistakes. Jesus beautifully restores him. But I want to give you one more dimension to the Peter story. And there, to do that, we have to go jump now into Acts chapter 3. And I've written the title down to this point as this, Power in Repentance. In Acts chapter 3, again, we pick up Peter's story. And it says here, this is obviously not that long after their encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And it says here, Peter, in Acts 3 verse 12 I'm reading from, Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. Remember, this is the moment when they were going to the temple and they were passed by the lame guy who was always in the same spot who asked for some money and he said, hey, uh, silver and gold have I none, but what I'll give you what I've got 
And that's the power of Jesus Christ operating in our lives. And he was instantly healed. So a crowd appears. He addresses the crowd and says, People of Israel, what is so surprising about this? Why stare at us as though we made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Peter, the fisherman, has now become this authoritative spiritual leader in Jerusalem with a voice and a confidence that just seems to cut through. Peter, the guy who was the denier, now, because Jesus restored him with a grace in such a beautiful way, there's no hesitation in Peter. There's no self-doubting in Peter. And there's definitely no timidity in Peter. There is nothing shy or, or um, hesitant about Peter's thought, uh, forthright language in this moment. I mean, he had clearly taken... Peter, the denier, badge off and stomped it into the ground. He was counting on God's grace for his life. Repentance stems from a Greek word, as we know the word repentance, from the Greek word mentonona. Yeah, that's how you say it. Uh, meaning, simply meaning 180 degree turn in the opposite direction. That little picture of Peter's life clearly shows this repentance. He's turned around. He's a different guy. He was the guy encouraging the disciples of Jesus to go fishing. And now he's at the temple speaking in boldness and strength about faith in Jesus Christ. He was simply living out what a repented life is, which is stop going in a direction about living for yourself. Turn around and start living in a direction where Jesus is Lord of all. Easy words to say. A lifetime of wrestle to live out is Jesus Lord of your life God's grace generates the opportunity for repentance the possibility of restoration which stands in front of all of us it's your choice of course to embrace God's gift of grace G G I mean, people go to the web for answers, www. But maybe we should go to the GGG, God's gift of grace. Well, maybe today you enjoy and live in God's grace today. Well done. Then our challenge is, can you give that same grace to other people? I mean, Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 18, strangely, maybe not strangely, he was telling the parable to Peter. And he says from verse 21, he says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how sh should I forgive someone who sins against me? Peter says, seven times. No, not seven times, Jesus replied. Seventy times seven. 
And he goes on and paints this picture and says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me, I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. And when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down and begged him for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? You may have be living in the middle and enjoying God's grace. Well done. So therefore, can we also then be a church? We talked about Hope You See is a grace-filled church. But could be, we be a church where people not like us be welcomed and feel safe so that they can hear and then experience God's grace for themselves. For example, could we welcome a wealthy celebrity and not be intimidated by them and just say, please come and sit with me in our church service? Could we then just as easily reach out to the person who looks destitute to say, welcome, glad to have you here. Could you come and sit beside me? Could you have in your life group people who don't look like you, don't have the same value system as you, and could you treat them equally? See, that's what a grace church is like. I mean, I would say that our church, particularly on the Central Coast, is a Central Coast Mariners church. We're top of the table. We're the most winningest team in the A-League again. Yes, well, let's not go there. But imagine in this church, we would say, we, we welcome Newcastle FC team supporters here. And they could sit beside you and you wouldn't have to yell and abuse at them and tell them how bad a team they were. Or, or maybe even worse, we... We had someone from Sydney FC support come and sit in the church and we would also welcome them. It's a funny example, but it's amazing how in life we always polarise ourselves and collect in a certain way. History has shown, more recent history anyway, that churches typically have been on a journey of building a fortress of a wall around ourselves to protect ourselves from a secular world. I mean, strangely, the gospel is not fragile, folks. It's very robust and very strong. It's lasted 2,000 years quite well without our little fortress. And yet for some reason, we're worried about who may or may not walk into our buildings. Maybe what we should be thinking about is a church where we're lowering the drawbridge down so that people can have easier access, where they can actually belong before they believe, where they would be willing to go on a journey and say, the reason why we're all in one building is because we all agree that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. That's a beautiful thing to be central about. And that's what I believe we're on the journey to do. So why don't you stand with me? I'd love to pray for you. 
Heavenly Father, I just thank You for the chance today where we can go deep into Your Word, where we can reflect and meditate on the interactions that You had with Peter and how that can be still applicable to our lives today. I thank You that You'll speak to our hearts again. Holy Spirit, that You'll uh, re-fire our hearts and uh, let us understand the, the, the desire for Your Gospel to go forth. Lord, again, we commit to You being Lord of everything. Everything, Lord. No matter what faults and failings that we have, we surrender and bend our knee again at Your altar. We thank you for this chance today to gather and to worship and be in fellowship with one another. In your powerful name, amen. I just want to take one minute. Every Wednesday at six o'clock here in the building, we have a class called Next Steps where we go through this little booklet together and it's designed for people who have... Uh, who, who really have, are coming into faith or, or don't quite understand about the journey of discipleship where we go through some of the basic tenets of what it means to become a Christian. I'd encourage first-time Christians and long-time Christians to at least come and be part of that course. At 7 o'clock then we've got Foundations of Faith where we then go a little deeper again. Every Wednesday here in the building, I'd welcome that. I'd love for you to be here. But of course, I don't know everyone in this building. I don't know how you got here today or why you're here. But I need to actually say, if you've never really made a commitment to Jesus, maybe you're in this belonging phase and you're coming up to, I believe, this moment right now where you have a chance to choose to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. It really just starts this moment as a prayer. After the prayer, it starts as a journey of your life where you are, then are in this repentant journey where you're then turning around 180 degrees and you'll stop living life by your design by, for to meet your needs and start to allow Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. Simple decision. It's your choice. But you can't truly enjoy redemption and restoration, a bit of R&R, &R, until you make that choice for Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to give people the opportunity. I'm asking you in this moment to respond by way, just lifting your hand where you are and say, Pastor Mark, would you please pray for me. I choose Jesus today. I choose redemption and restoration. I see your hand there. Thank you. If you've raised your hand, you can lower your hand. I'm not here to embarrass you, but I'm definitely here to encourage people on this journey of R&R. &R. Anyone else here before we pray? Awesome. Church together, all together, as a community of faith, all sorts of different types of people in this room. But we're all here under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I make you Lord of my life. I make you Lord of my life. I turn away from living for myself. I turn away from and I make you Lord of my life. Make you Lord. Holy Spirit, fill me today. Guide me, lead me, comfort me. I am now a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. And everyone here said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Let's give these people a hand. If you raised your hand, one of our uh, team members I've asked to help me today is going to gift you this booklet and the Bible. And please accept that as a gift from hope you see to you. But if you didn't raise your hand, but what I'm talking about has um, really hit and struck deeply in you. Can I ask that you would see someone with a lanyard where you say, hey, can I have that next step booklet? And we'll know 
what that's code for a conversation. If not, you're welcome to come here Wednesday. Regardless of whether you've been invited or not, the door is always wide open on a Wednesday here for you to come and be part of that Next Steps class. God bless your church.